Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello and welcome. Today's presentation, Cancer Treatment Options, Understanding Radiation Therapy, is presented by Dr. Nicholas Prionis, a UCSF radiation oncologist at the Washington Radiation Oncology Center. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Nicholas Prionis. Good afternoon. It's an absolute honor to have the uh, opportunity to speak to you today. Um, given that we're living through an unprecedented, unprecedented pandemic, I'll be wearing a mask during today's talk, uh, so I apologize if the, any of the sound is muffled, but there'll be an opportunity to enter any questions through um, the uh, website, and I'd be happy to answer them at the end of this talk. The fact that you're logged in today to listen to this talk is a testament to the fact that a cancer diagnosis, or even the possibility of a cancer diagnosis, is a terrifying moment in anybody's life. And the treatments that are used to treat cancer can be scary, or at the very least confusing. So I hope that today I will demystify what radiation therapy is and how it's used to treat cancer. By the end of today's talk, I hope that you will better understand when radiation is used to treat cancer, what therapeutic radiation even is, how it's used to actually treat cancer and kill cancer cells, what the common side effects are from radiation therapy, and what kind of advances are occurring in radiation oncology that are making radiation treatment more accurate and safer. If we look at the leading causes of death in the United States, ignoring the big blue other causes section, the leading cause of death is heart disease as of 2017, and close behind is cancer. But over the past 45 years, there's been a steady drop in the death rate that is caused by heart disease and a moderate, modest decline in the death rate from cancer. But proportionally, cancer has become a more predominant problem, especially in people aged 65 or older. In 2020, it's predicted that almost 900,000 men will be diagnosed with cancer, and similarly, about 900,000 women will be diagnosed with cancer. The most common cancer in men is still prostate cancer, and the most common cancer in women, breast cancer. And the second most common cancer, but the leading cancer killer, is still lung cancer. And among these approximately 1.8 million people who are diagnosed with cancer, about half will be treated with radiation treatment. Now, the word radiation is scary and it can be portrayed in some ways in the popular culture or media that uh, provoke even more anxiety. My, my goal here is to shift your frame to not see it from these images, but instead from these, where radiation therapy is really the highly coordinated, precise and accurate delivery of radiation to treat cancer and to help someone who's going through the journey of cancer therapy. Let's start off with when is radiation therapy even used? <clears throat> Taking a big step back, when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, they have a team of physicians who are gonna help them through this journey. A medical oncologist, also called a hematology oncologist, or just broadly an oncologist, even though all these team members are truly oncologists. And the medical oncologist is the doctor who is in charge of prescribing medicines that treat the whole body, chemotherapies, immunotherapies, endocrine or hormone therapy. A surgical oncologist is responsible for using surgery to resect or cut out cancer when it's safe to do so. And they're trained to do so in specific sites of the body, whether that is, you know, in the bladder or in the lung or the breast. And a radiation oncologist who is a highly specialized oncologist trained to use radiation in a therapeutic way to treat specific parts of the body that are being affected by cancer. It helps to understand how cancer spreads in order to get a sense of how these different treatments work and what the roles of these dif different providers is. Cancer spreads in three main ways. The first is direct invasion or local spread. So in this picture here, a lung cancer is shown in the right upper lung. And direct invasion is, is growth of this cancer into the surrounding normal lung. But cancer can also spread regionally through the lymphatic system, the lymphatic system being the system of vessels draining the body of 
fluid back towards the heart. We have to remember our body is 60% water. And along that lymphatic system are the lymph nodes, which are like little filters cleaning up that fluid. Cancer has a habit of hopping on that system and getting stuck in those lymph nodes, the regional lymph nodes draining a, a specific part of the body. And cancer cells can also get into the blood system, bloodstream, and go to far away sites, far away from where they started, including the brain or the bones or the liver. And that's called distant spread. So the different types of treatments offered by that team of physicians really tries to address these different types of spread or risk of cancer spreading in the body. I'll try to show that visually here, and I apologize, I'm not an artist, so this is a, a crude schematic, but we're looking at a CT scan of somebody's head. So the bottom of the picture is the back of their head, the top of the picture is the front of their head. And that blue shape is intended to represent a tumor. The red dots are kind of like cancer cells that maybe have spread far away from that tumor to other parts of the brain. So a surgeon might try to remove the bulk of the tumor that is actually visible on a scan. There's no way to necessarily see those smaller red dots on an MRI scan or a CT scan. But a medical oncologist can use chemotherapies or other targeted medicines that go into the bloodstream and go to the whole body and can try to, try to kill off those small cancer cells and shrink any remaining tumor that was left behind after surgery. Afterwards, if there's any microscopic disease left behind, radiation therapy targeting that area where the surgery happened is extremely effective at lowering the chance that cancer can come back in that area. So in essence, radiation is a local or regional therapy, meaning it's effective in the places where we point it, not to the whole body, but to specific body parts or the lymph node areas that drain that body part. But radiation therapy has a role really from initial diagnosis in somebody who just finds out they have cancer to somebody who is more advanced stage and the, sh the intent of treatment has shifted from cure maybe to improving quality of life and helping treat symptoms related to cancer. If we look at curative intent, radiation can be, can be used with or without chemotherapy and in a definitive sense, be used to treat a tumor, for example, lung cancer. It could be used after surgery to prevent cancer from coming back in that part of the body, for example, after breast conserving surgery for breast cancer. It can be used before surgery to shrink down a tuber, tumor and make it more likely to be removed with surgery while simultaneously preventing it from coming back in that area, for example, in rectal cancer. But many people have advanced cancer where cure is not an option and instead we try to palliate or treat their symptoms. And radiation is a very, very effective way to treat symptoms related to cancer. That could be pain, bleeding, or a tumor that is causing obstruction. For example, a tumor near the spine that might be pressing on the spinal cord or other nerves causing neurological compromise or pain. And the goal is to, again, improve quality of life without necessarily extending somebody's life. Let's look at some more specific examples. For example, early stage breast cancer. If someone chooses to undergo a lumpectomy or breast conserving surgery, we have very strong data from big trials and meta-analyses of these trials that show that radiation is very effective at preventing the cancer from coming back. So shown in this graph here is the percent chance that cancer might come back over time on the x-axis in years. So you wanna be lower down on one of these curves, less likely for cancer to come back. The top curve is BCS, breast conserving surgery, and the bottom is breast conserving surgery with radiation. I'd much rather be on that lower curve. Let's talk about lung cancer, specifically early stage lung cancer. There's some data that supports the fact that ablative radi radiation can treat a small early stage lung cancer as well as surgery. So shown here is the chance of living without cancer coming back as a function of time on the x-axis. And surgery is in the red line and ablative radiation is in the blue line. And they are very similar and importantly, very close to 100%, meaning these people lived without their cancer coming back. So radiation as a standalone treatment for early stage lung cancer is a standard for people who can't undergo surgery and is an ongoing area of study as an alternative to surgery. Let's talk about prostate cancer. Radiation is a, a, a treatment option for prostate cancer. Here I'm showing 
after someone has chosen to undergo a prostatectomy, removal of the prostate gland. And if they have high risk features, such as a positive margin, meaning that maybe some cancer was left behind, or more extensive disease that was expanding outside of the prostate, perforating through the capsule of the prostate, or invading the seminal vesicles, radiation can prevent progression of disease. So here we have on the y-axis the chance that someone progresses as measured by the prostate-specific antigen, a blood test, increasing over time, which is on the x-axis. So it's better to be on a higher curve here, closer to 100% chance that you do not progress. And in the light blue, we have patients who got radiation. And underneath that dark blue, patients that were just watched. So again, radiation is very effective at preventing cancer from coming back. Now, what is therapeutic radiation? Therapeutic radiation is electromagnetic radiation. And on the spectrum of different types of electromagnetic radiation, we have in the middle visible light, the light coming from the sun. Lower energies on the left include things like radio waves and microwaves and the signals coming from our cell phones. And that's not to suggest that those are in any way uh, used to treat cancer or even necessarily cause cancer, because it's that red bar on the far right, ionizing radiation, high energy electromagnetic radiation, that through that ionization process can be used to treat cancer. As a brief history about x-rays, they were first discovered in 1895 by Willem Rinken. And um, these were low energy x-rays, first used to create pictures like radiographs when you go get an x-ray at the doctors nowadays. And on the right is actually the first image that was ever created using x-rays, a picture of his wife's hand. You can actually see her wedding ring on her finger. And within the first year, by 1896, x-rays were being used to try to treat cancer. Fast forward five decades, and we have the development of the first clinical linear accelerator, a device used to generate x-rays for the treatment of cancer. And you might recognize that aerial photo, which is you know, the backyard here in the Bay Area, a picture of the Stanford Linear Accelerator, the two mile long device, if you will, that is used to accelerate particles to study how they interact with each other. That technology was min miniaturized to create the clinical linear accelerator and used to treat the first patient, this two year old boy, uh, of a lymphoma that he had. Now, when people say radiation treatment, they're generally referring to high energy x-rays or high energy photons. That's the most common, but there are other types of radiation. We just mentioned low energy photons or even particles, electrons, protons, and alpha particles. The best way to understand the difference is to look at how they interact at depth within um, some sort of subject, like a person's body. So here we're looking at dose, the amount of radiation um, energy that's deposited in this mass as a function of depth, where zero centimeters is the surface. So that'd be somebody's skin and depth is deeper. If we look at that blue line, all of the dose is right up front, right on the skin. So if you had a tumor deep in the body, you would essentially fry the skin before you could ever treat that tumor that's deep inside. So we had to learn how to develop higher energy x-rays shown in that green curve, where the maximum radiation dose is at some depth and you're actually sparing the skin. So now you can treat something deeper. Now protons, which you may have heard of, are particles and the way they interact is shown in the red curve. So at the skin, there's a low amount of radiation dose that's deposited. And then there's a huge spike, a peak, where it's all deposited at once, the so-called Bragg peak. And importantly, nothing beyond that. So this is a great feature of these particles. So you could treat something at depth knowing that no radiation would be deposited beyond that point. In theory, it's a great, great uh, feature of these types of radiation. In practice, it's a little more complicated. There are various devices and technologies used to deliver radiation. And again, talking mainly about high energy x-rays, we have the clinical linear accelerator, a modern machine shown here, not like the previous machine we showed, which is now in the Smithsonian. But there are also ways to deliver radiation internally, or so-called brachytherapy, where radiation is coming from the inside of the body out. And that is shown in this picture here on the bottom right, where there's um, a man lying down on his back and we're looking almost from the side. And needles are being placed through the skin into the prostate gland so that radiation seeds can be put inside to treat from the inside out. Those seeds could be permanent or temporary and removed at the end of this pr procedure. But it allows us to give very high doses, large amounts of radiation right where we want it from the inside out. 
but how is it that radiation can even treat these cancer cells? Again, it's the, that word ionizing, ionizing radiation. So there's two main ways that these ionizations treat cancer cells, directly or indirectly. On the top, we're looking at a photon, a high energy X-ray interacting with an atom, most likely of water, since our body is 60% water. And that ionization event causes free radicals. And the free radicals of water then go on to damage the DNA of the cancer cell. Alternatively, the ionization event and the electron that comes off could directly damage the DNA. That's less common, but also possible. And we take advantage of the fact that these cancer cells don't know how to repair from that DNA damage. Cancer cells are deficient in the mechanisms to repair DNA, whereas normal cells still have that intact. Also, rapidly dividing cells are more sensitive to radiation, like cancer cells. So we've come to learn, actually through a classic experiment performed in Paris, that's why this ram is wearing a beret, otherwise it'd be pretty strange, uh, still is strange. This, this ram was being sterilized with x-rays, and it was noticed that with one large treatment of high, dose X, high uh, energy x-rays, the skin of the scrotum became red and irritated. But by splitting that treatment up over multiple treatments, the skin was protected, it had a chance to heal. So we learned that giving radiation treatments over multiple treatments gives normal cells a chance to heal while still treating the cancer. Let's talk about the logistics of what it actually looks like to undergo radiation treatment. We start off with a planning scan a so-called simulation CT scan. We're simulating the treatment, but no treatment is actually done. This is in the upper left here. It's a two to three hour appointment, and you come in and lay down. And we have all sorts of devices to help immobilize you and put you in the position so that you're comfortable, but also is stable to undergo radiation treatment. It's the exact position you'll actually be in for the treatment. In this case, this woman has her arms above her head with a cushion under her knees and is most likely getting simulated and prepared for breast cancer treatment. In the middle, there's a treatment planning process with a whole team of specialists, dosimetrists, physicists, who help create these radiation plans and then test them to make sure that they're safe through various quality assurance procedures so that we know it's safe before actually delivering it to a person. Somebody comes back about a week after that planning process and starts the once daily treatments and those treatments are on weekdays only, not on weekends or holidays. The number of treatments depends on whether we're treating a certain type of body part, a certain type of cancer, and what the intention of the radiation treatment is. It can be anywhere from one to 40 treatments over multiple weeks, one to eight weeks. But in, a, in effect, the radiation beam is only on for a short amount of time, five to 15 minutes. And the total visit time each day is only 30 to 45 minutes, relatively brief. Now, you're probably wondering, what are the side effects of radiation? You told me it can help treat cancer, but what's the, what's the downside? Well, the side effects from radiation depend on which part of the body is being treated, which part is being exposed to radiation. We can broadly think of two categories of side effects. Early side effects. These are symptoms that someone may experience from the radiation treatment, usually starting two to three weeks into the treatment. So that means they are without symptoms for the first couple of weeks progressing and peaking one to two weeks after finishing the full course of treatment and resolving over the subsequent six to eight weeks. But there are also late risks, late meaning months to years after radiation treatment. In general, the side effects of radiation are specific to where the radiation is pointed. Now the caveat to that is that fatigue is a common side effect from radiation that does affect the whole body. And if a significant amount of bone marrow is nearby the radiation beam, bone marrow being responsible for creating blood cells, there could be decreased blood counts. But otherwise, common side effects are skin irritation near the area of treatment, hair loss near the area of treatment, not throughout the body, and otherwise inflammation of the tissues in the surrounding area. And it's the responsi responsibility of a radiation oncologist to pay attention and design a safe radiation treatment that minimizes the chance of any of these side effects from happening. We can step through briefly some examples, but um, we won't belabor all of the details. This is really the conversation that happens through with a radiation oncologist with a patient when discussing the specific treatment that they might be going through. So for example, when treating the head and neck, 
the tissues that are nearby include the mucous membranes, membranes of the mouth, of the throat, the esophagus or the swallowing tube. And during treatment, irritation of those surfaces can lead to dry mouth or loss of taste. And some of the late side effects related to those tissues relate to permanent dry mouth or from dry mouth, increased risk of dental decays. Again, we won't go through all of these, but the goal is to make any of these side effects as unlikely as possible through very careful design of radiation treatment, understanding anatomy, and understanding the physics of how the radiation works. In breast cancer treatment, treating the breast, it's very common to experience skin irritation or fatigue. Long-term risks relate to essentially scarring of the tissues in the area. So the skin being potentially a little tighter, muscles potentially feeling a little bit tighter, which can all be improved with stretching, range of motion exercises. As a last example, when treating the prostate or pelvis, now you have the bladder and the intestines nearby. So irritation of the bladder can cause urinary frequency or urgency, or even irritation of the rectum causing diarrhea. And long-term risks in this area relate to effects on the blood vessels as, as listed here. Now, while radiation is used to cure cancer, you may have heard that radiation can cause cancer. And it's true that in about maybe one in a thousand people who get radiation treatment, they may come back with a new cancer in the area of treatment decades later, as soon as eight years, maybe 15, 20 years after the radiation treatment. It's usually not the cancer they started with, but a different type of cancer. And the data I've shown here is actually in children because children are most at risk of developing these second cancers. So this is the chance of developing a cancer on the y-axis over time since they were diagnosed with their initial cancer. And the blue curve, which is secondary cancer, is what we're looking at. In adults, the risk is, is lower, so we pay particular attention to being careful with radiation in younger people. In order to minimize the chance of any of these things happening, there have been many advances in radiation oncology to make treatment more accurate and therefore safer, less toxic. One is the so-called multi-leaf collimator, an array of these small metal plates that can be used to shape the radiation beam to very specific shapes, avoiding the tissues that don't need to see radiation, focusing down on the ones affected by cancer. Pairing that with technologies that move the radiation machine around the patient to give a small amount of radiation from different angles or continuously through continuous rotation allows us to create ra very steep differences between the amount of radiation going to the area that we intend to treat as compared to, compared to the surrounding areas. These technologies are called IMRT and VMAT. We're not so great with naming things in our field, but IMRT you can see here is stopping in seven different positions around the body with these radiation beams intersecting, in, in this case in the prostate, and VMAT continuously rotating around the patient to give a high dose of radiation to the prostate with a very small amount to the surrounding tissues. This allows us to spare different parts of the body and do some fancy techniques like bone marrow sparing. So here we can use a PET CT scan to identify the parts of the pelvic bones in figure A, which are not active, not creating blood cells, versus the parts that are creating blood cells in panel B and they're overlaid in panel C. So now we can avoid the red parts of the bone and be less concerned about the yellow parts of the bone getting radiation. These techniques lead to less, less toxicity and therefore better quality of life. So this is actually data that's come out of a big trial looking at radiation treatment for lung cancer. And we're looking at the decline in quality of life as measured on a survey. These are patients who actually reported this, comparing 3D CRT, classic radiation, to these more high-tech IMRT techniques you want to be on a smaller bar graph here. So at three months, IMRT is smaller, and at 12 months, IMRT is smaller, showing that quality of life, the decrement in quality of life was less with IMRT. Now, things in the body are moving, and we're talking about being on target. So other techniques, other advances, revolve around accounting for motion, for example, respiratory motion. Here we're looking at somebody who is um, undergoing radiation treatment to the breast in the first panel, we're looking at slices through their body at the level of the chest and the level of the heart that are horizontal slices. In the middle panel, looking at them from the side and 
in the far right panel, looking at them face on. And you can see that when they're breathing freely, the position of the heart is that pink contour. But when they take a deep breath, the diaphragm pulls down, it pulls the heart downwards, and now it's in the position of that yellow or gold contour. And that maneuver of taking a deep breath has pulled the heart away from the breast, creating a gap between the heart and the area that is intended to be treated with radiation, therefore minimizing the exposure of the heart to radiation. I'll play this video for you, which shows the point here. We're looking at somebody face on. This is their liver. And maybe there's a spot in the liver here. This red area is the area we intend to treat, kind of like our radiation field. But if we follow their breathing, we can see that as the diaphragm moves up and down, this area is moving up and down. And part of that lung, the black area, moves into the radiation treatment area. There's no need to expose the lung to radiation. So technological advances have focused on how to time treatment to this breathing pattern. One way is to follow the breathing pattern and when the liver is in the right position, only then treat. Another one is to actually track the position of this tumor and change the focus of the radiation beam to follow it. When you combine all of these advances together, it's opened up a whole new paradigm of radiation treatment, including something called stereotactic ablative radiation therapy. And I'll just emphasize the word ablative. It's an opportunity to give very large amounts of radiation to an area we want to treat over a small number of treatments. And it's only possible because we now can use image guidance and motion management, as I've shown you, to avoid all the normal tissues. Radiation to normal tissue is just side effects. And why is it a new paradigm? We have come to learn that this can be used to treat people who have more advanced disease and actually prolong their life. So in the plot here on the right, this is looking at the survival of people with advanced cancer over time, whether they got standard of care chemotherapy in the blue line versus ablative radiation in the red line. Being on a higher line means better survival. So this has now created a whole new possibility for ablative radiation to be used in people who have cancer that has gone beyond where it started in a limited fashion, assuming it hasn't gone to many, many places. I hope that I have given you a little bit of insight into radiation therapy in this brief time we've had together. I'd like to summarize just saying that therapeutic radiation is again, highly coordinated, precise delivery of ionizing radiation for the treatment of cancer. And it's customized to each person. Therape therapeutic radiation treats cancer through DNA damage, both through indirect and direct mechanisms. Common side effects include fatigue and skin irritation, the skin irritation in the area that is being treated. And other side effects depend on which body part is being targeted. And as you've seen, just a couple of examples of the many technological advances that are leading to more accurate treatment that is safer with less side effects. I would be happy to take any questions with you and thank you again uh, for taking the afternoon to, to listen to this talk on radiation therapy. Our first question, do I need to restrict who I see while on treatment and am I radioactive? Again, as there are some pictures in popular culture of radiation making people radioactive and oftentimes I get this question of do I need to be quarantined because I'm getting radiation treatment? When you're receiving the common radiation treatment with high dose x-rays, excuse me, high energy x-rays, you do not need to be quarantined from people. You can see your family, you can be in places that are safe. And in this area, uh, era of COVID, that really still means sticking to the precautions of physical distancing and limiting physical contact for COVID reasons, but not because of radiation reasons. There are less common types of radiation treatment where a radioactive material is put inside of the body, and that might require being protected from other people. But that is a rarity the most common types of radiation treatment do not require any type of isolation. Okay. Am I on immunocompromised? Another very common question that we often get about um, radiation treatment, because other types of cancer treatment can lower the blood counts and can suppress your immune system, like chemotherapy. Radiation treatment, the answer is it depends. Again, as I, as I previously mentioned, if a large 
portion of the bone marrow is exposed to radiation and the blood counts go down, that does put someone at increased risk of infection. And in a sense, their immune, your, their immune system is lower. But when treating parts of the body that don't have a large portion of bone marrow, immunosuppression is not necessarily common. So for example, breast cancer treatment does not necessarily cause any immunosuppression, but treatment to the pelvis, which has a large amount of bone marrow, can. And if there is chemotherapy used simultaneously, it's important to monitor somebody's immune system and their blood counts to make sure that they don't end up at risk for any infections. Should I change my diet during treatment? Diet is so important to life. And ultimately, the recommendation is eat a healthy, balanced diet. While undergoing radiation treatment, one does not generally need to change their diet in any special way. The only caveat, the only thing that we do recommend is avoiding high dose, large amounts of antioxidants. As I mentioned, uh, radiation works by causing free radicals that damage the DNA. Antioxidants work by scavenging and cleaning up free radicals. Now you'll say blueberries are antioxidants. I'm not saying you should stop eating blueberries. You would have to eat truckloads of blueberries before you actually impacted the effectiveness of the radiation. It's really avoiding going and buying supplements of uh, vitamins, specifically vitamin E, for example, and not taking that just during the time of the radiation treatment. How do I prevent uh, fatigue? Fatigue is one of the common side effects of radiation treatment. Um, and if somebody's had other treatments like chemotherapy, they may already have fatigue from those treatments. So it can be an, an issue for patients. It can get in the way of the daily living you wanna have. So it is helpful to do everything possible to fight off that fatigue. It turns out one of the most effective antidotes for fatigue is actually activity itself. And we recommend a minimum of 30 minutes three days per week of elevating the heart rate, whether that's walking um, or other aerobic exercise, and that can really help to stave off the fatigue. But ultimately, you also have to listen to your body, and whether that means needing an extra nap or going to bed early, um, that, that is reasonable. Now, of course, that is all, again, challenging in this era of the COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS pandemic. And similarly with these current fires, which are making it difficult to go outside, but any activities you can find that are cardiovascular three times a week are very helpful. Okay, great. Well, this concludes our program. Thank you, Dr. Prionis, for your expertise. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. The entire broadcast of today's event will be available on our Facebook page. We look forward to hosting more Facebook Live events in the future.